Greetings, mother factors, and get ready for a different kind of party, as I'm Chris. Today we've got a lovely and very light-hearted episode for you all. No, not bees. I wish it was bees. It's the European Union, the place where... <laughs> you'll find out. Also, I'm doing a Getting to Know Me video, but I've had quite a few technical difficulties this week, so I'm aiming to have it ready for you for next week. If you didn't leave your questions in the community post on the channel, feel free to leave them below. But does the EU really have a 25,000 word regulation for cabbages? Why did they end up with a banknote named after an international terrorist? Why is it when babies scream and throw a tantrum in public, it's classified as a minor nuisance, but when I do it, I'm being an aggressor and sir, this is a Wendy's. Two out of these three questions are going to be answered. So sit down, please leave your nasty comments until after class. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hand in your homework at the end of the lecture. Okay, cue mouthwash video. All right, yeah. This is 101 facts about the European Union. Number one. The European Union is an international organization made up of 27 member states and it governs economic, social, political and security policies across those countries. Number two. At the time of writing, those 27 fully-fledged members are, in no particular order, Belgium, Germany, Spain, Cyprus, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Estonia, France, Latvia, Malta, Portugal, Finland, Chechnya, Czechia, Ireland, Croatia, Lithuania, the Netherlands, Romania, Sweden, Denmark, Greece, Italy, Luxembourg, Austria, and Slovenia. Number 3. Taken as a whole, the economy of the European Union is massive with a capital big. About $15.2 trillion of capital big in 2020. According to the World Bank, only the USA have a bigger GDP. The three biggest economies inside the EU are Germany on $3.8 trillion, France on $2.6 trillion, and Italy with $1.9 trillion. Number 4. Approximately 447.7 million people live in the EU. The most populous member state is Germany, with 83.2 million folks living there. The smallest is Malta. The Mediterranean island nation clocks in with 516,000 people. Number 5. By area, the European Union measures over 4 million square kilometers. I'd like to be more exact, but estimates vary as much as 400,000 square kilometers as it's possible to include some territories that aren't in Europe as part of the EU, but we'll get to that later. The smallest country by land area, though, congrats again to Malta, with 315 square kilometers. The biggest is France, racking up 632,833 square kilometers. Number 6. The European Union has its own money, the Euro, which is the official currency of 19 of the 27 EU member states. The EU countries that use the Euro make up the Eurozone. Number 7. The 8 countries that have kept their currency are Bulgaria, Croatia, Czechia, Hungary, Poland, Romania and Sweden. However, all those member states are expected to sign up to the Euro once they've met certain conditions. But there is no mechanism to force them to adopt it. Only one country, Denmark, has an opt-out meaning they are under no obligation to use the euro, and they don't. Number 8. There are 24 EU official languages. They are Bulgarian, Czech, Croatian, Danish, Dutch, English, Estonian, Finnish, French, German, Greek, Hungarian, Italian, Irish, Latvian, Lithuanian, Maltese, Polish, Portuguese, Romanian, Slovak, Slovene, Spanish, and Swedish. Number 9. The Belgian city of Brussels is widely considered the capital of the European Union, as it plays host to some of the EU's key institutions. The Commission, the European Council, the Council of the EU, and some aspects of the European Parliament. Number 10. However, it is not the only European city with claims to represent the EU. Strasbourg in France is the main seat of the European Parliament, while Frankfurt in Germany hosts the European Central Bank. Luxembourg City, capital of Luxembourg, half a point if you get that right, also hosts some key institutions like the Court of Justice of the European Union. Number 11. Okay, but where did this all begin? Well, technically, the European Union only came into existence in 1993, following the adoption of the Maastricht Treaty, but, of course, its origins go way, way back. Arguably all the way to World War II, when Europe spent 1939 to 1945 smashing itself to pieces. Number 12. 
European leaders concluded that maybe European nations should start working together. A certain Mr. Winston Churchill stated in a 1946 speech, We must build a kind of United States of Europe. I like to imagine that's what he sounds like. One of the first steps in that direction was the creation of the Council of Europe in 1949. It aimed to promote human rights, the rule of law, and democracy across Europe. Number 13. The Council of Europe still exists today and is not part of the EU, confusingly enough. It has 47 members. In fact, the only European countries that are not full members are Belarus, Kazakhstan, and the Vatican City. Number 14. Arguably, however, the first real step towards the EU was the creation of the European Coal and Steel Community, first proposed by French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman in 1950. The idea was to integrate the coal and steel industries of Western Europe, creating a common market for those resources and placing them under common regulation. In other words, countries would give up some control over those parts of the economy. Uh, num who am I? Number 15. The idea was to prevent any future war between rivals France and West Germany, and Western Europe in general. After all, how can you make war when you no longer control the resources needed to power your economy? The European Coal and Steel Community, or ECSC, or X as I like to say, it, came into effect in 1952 after the signing of the Treaty of Paris. Number 16. The six members who joined were Belgium, France, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and West Germany. These governments had essentially agreed to hand over regulation for coal, steel, and some other industries to the institutions of the ECSC. This handing over of power by national governments to another authority is called supranationalism. Number 17. And you know what? Those six countries love working together so much, they thought, let's take this relationship to the next level. Let's get to second base. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But in 1957, those six signed up to the Treaties of Rome that deepened their cooperation. Number 18. The two Treaties of Rome created the European Atomic Energy Community, which, uh, kinda like this channel, did exactly what it said on the tin. Euratom, as the cool kids called it, was designed to promote cooperation in atomic energy, enhancing its development and use between the six nations. Number 19. However, the big daddy of the Rome Treaties was the birth of the European Economic Community. The EEC, or EEC as I like to call it, was much closer to the European Union that we know today. It committed the signatories to an ever closer union in the future. More immediately, it created a customs union and a single economic area, removing trade barriers between the six. Number 20. The EEC wasn't just one massive market, though. The members also agreed to join common political and economic policies. Agriculture, trade, transport, and later, environmental, social, and industrial policies were also included. Number 21. But who would be running this community? Well, the main institutions that would run the show were the Council of Ministers, the Commission, the Parliamentary Assembly, which later became the European Parliament, and the Court of Justice. But don't worry, politics nerds, we'll get bogged down in the details of those later. I'm Taylor Swift, and I sing 22. Like all great dramas, the EEC needed a rival, and it got one in 1960. Enter, presumably to dramatic music, the EFTA, or the European Free Trade Association. This was a different club of European countries that wanted to trade with each other, but didn't want any of the political or social integration the EEC had entered into. Number 23. The founding members of the EFTA were Austria, Denmark, Norway, Portugal, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. These countries were known as the Outer Seven, while the EEC countries were called the Inner Six. Now let the economic battle commence! Number 24. In 1962, the EEC introduced one of its more controversial measures, the Common Agriculture Policy, or the CAP, which established the EEC's approach to farming. At its most basic, it subsidized farming to ensure the EEC countries would be able to produce enough food and guarantee supplies, to help improve farming techniques, and to make sure farming provided a good living for those in the sector. Number 25. However, funding farming was quite expensive. 
At one point in 1985, the EEC was spending 73% of its budget on the CAP. Even today, 37% of the EU's budget is spent on subsidizing farming. In 2017, more than half of an average Irish farm's income is from CAP support. Number 26. The policy has been widely criticized and had ended up creating some nasty consequences. In the 1970s and 1980s, the EEC ended up creating so-called butter mountains and lakes of milk and wine. Not literally, of course, even though that would be pretty cool. But essentially, the EEC would set a minimum price for produce to guarantee that farmers got paid a decent living. But this led to overproduction as farmers cashed in. Then the EEC was left with a lot of produce. Number 27. In 2015, for example, the EU used public money to buy 380,000 tons of skim milk powder as there was a crisis in the industry at that time. That's more than the whole of France produced in 2016, by the way. All that milk, the dairy lakes as it were, was then stored in warehouses across the continent, with a view to one day selling the stocks. Number 28. Meanwhile, let's go back to the past, as the economies of the Inner Six were booming in the 1960s. Between 1958 and 1968, trade between the EEC's members quadrupled in value. In 1968, they introduced free cross-border trade between themselves and set common duties and imports coming from outside the group. Number 29. Things were going well, sure, but like all six-way marriages, things can get tense. Arguments could happen. Who's going to do the washing up, take out the bins, try to stop majority rule? Oh, wait, that last one. It was France. Under the leadership of Charles de Gaulle in 1965, the French boycotted meetings of the Council of Europe, creating, drumroll please, the empty chair crisis. Ooh. Okay, fine. Not the most exciting name for a crisis, but what do you want? Number 30. The six EEC countries had agreed to start deciding some matters by a system of majority voting. But de Gaulle wasn't happy about this and had French representatives boycott European institutions, leaving chairs empty in those institutions, hence the name of the crisis. The result was that the six member states agreed to disagree and came up with the Luxembourg Compromise, a sort of gentleman's agreement with no legal basis to allow a country to veto something if it was a vital national interest. Number 31. Sounds good in practice, but it's generally accepted that the Luxembourg Compromise of 1966 pretty much paralyzed decision-making in the EEC for the best part of two decades. The threat of someone invoking it meant that pretty much everything had to be agreed unanimously, which takes ages. The first time the compromise was ignored was in 1982, when Britain tried to use it to block agricultural spending, but everyone else just looked the other way. The Luxembourg Compromise's importance had subsequently waned. Number 32. Speaking of the UK, after helping set up the arrival of the EFTA and having turned down the invitations to be involved in the European project, it changed tack and decided to join the EEC. Except there was just one problem, and his name was Charles de Gaulle. The French president twice vetoed British applications to join the club in 1963 and 1967. He was concerned that the UK would never be fully committed to Europe and would be more interested in its relationship with the USA. Number 33. However, it was the third times the charm thing for Britain in 1973, after de Gaulle had left power as it finally joined the three European committees, the EEC, the Eurotom, and the Coal and Steel. It gained membership at the same time as Ireland and Denmark, taking the overall number of countries involved to nine, the first expansion wah, 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 back in 1957. Number 34. One country that didn't join in 1973 was Norway. It too had tried to join in the 1960s and had been rebuffed twice, but when it looked set to join with the other new countries, the Norwegian public said, nah. In a 1972 referendum, 53.5% of the country rejected the membership. Number 35. The Norwegian government would try to gain EU membership much later, in the 1990s. But once again, the public weren't keen. In 1994, they voted 52.2% against membership. To this day, it remains outside the European Union. Number 36. 1975 saw the introduction of the European Regional Development Fund, the idea that the rich EEC countries would help fund the development of the poorer regions, with money to attract investment, develop infrastructure, and boost the job market. Number 37. 
This was also a period of upheaval outside of the European communities. The authoritarian regime in Portugal came to an end in 1974, and that same year, military rule in Greece also collapsed. A year later, Spanish dictator General Franco died. All three countries would turn to democracy in the future, paving the way for their potential memberships of the European project. Number 38 Speaking of democracy, the European community took an important step to embracing this in 1979, when the first elections to the European Parliament took place across all nine member states. Until this date, members of the European Parliament were simply appointed by each country's national parliament. Number 39 each country got a set number of members of European Parliaments MEPs, with bigger countries like France getting more seats than smaller countries like Luxembourg. Inside, the Parliament isn't divided along national lines, but into pan-European political groupings. Number 40 the 80s saw the European communities grow even more. In 1981, newly democratic Greece joined the club and five years later, Spain and Portugal followed suit. Now covering much of Western Europe, the European communities now stood at 12 member states. Number 41 uh. But the 80s weren't just about the European Union coloring in the map of Europe. Things were getting real tasty with some new initiatives. 1983 saw the introduction of the European Year campaigns, which remain in place to this day. The idea behind them is to spark discussion between member states on a certain issue and provide funding for related projects. The Meaning of Life The very first European Year was all about, drumroll please, small and medium-sized businesses. Exciting. Things have got a lot juicier since then. In 2021, for example, the European year was about rail. No, you heard me. Rail. Basically making sure people in the EU know how sweet trains are. Slightly more rock and roll was in 2018 and the 23,000 events held across Europe to celebrate Europe's cultural heritage. Number 43. In 1984, the European communities launched eSprit, their first ever research and development program. The first of many, I should say, too. The name stood for European Strategic Program for Research and Development in Information Technology, or as I like to call it, the European doodah for making sure we know how computers work. Number 44. More broadly, these European R&D projects are designed to encourage cooperation between research teams across the EU and provide funding. A lot of funding. The Horizon 2020 project provided almost 80 billion euros in funding for scientists between 2014 and 2020, making it the biggest project to date undertaken by the EU. Number 45. Anyway, back to the 80s. And aside from the massive hair and massive tunes, it was also a time for massive political decisions. Step forward the Single European Act of 1987. You may remember that way back in 1968, member countries got rid of all their custom duties to help boost trade. However, two decades later, there were still obstacles like each country having its own rules and regulations. Number 46. The Single European Act, or C, to its friends, gave the European community six years to sort out these differences and create a genuine single market between all member states. In effect, there would be no borders allowing goods, services, money, and people to move freely between any countries involved. Number 47, my mom drove a car. The C also boosted the powers of the European institutions at the expense of national governments. Any laws that were designed to establish the single market, except free movement of people, taxation, and the rights of workers, could now be decided by a majority vote. Things like social, science, and environmental stuff could now be decided by a qualified majority voting. Number 48. Just a little EU explainer here. Qualified majority, QM, voting is a system of decision making in the Council of the European Union, otherwise known as the Council of Ministers, which approves and can amend proposals. Under QM voting, each member state is given a certain number of votes in the Council based on its size and population. Therefore, someone like Germany will have more votes than Belgium. To pass a vote, ultimately at least half the population and half the member states must agree. Politics, baby. I think I, I'm genuinely lost at this point. Number 49. However, it isn't just the Council of Ministers that get to rule on what proposals should become laws. The European Parliament now acts alongside the Council to help make those decisions, and that's thanks, in part, to the Single European Act. Boom! Call back! The C gave the European Parliament more oversight of some draft laws, thus setting its new role in motion. 
Number 50. <laughs> I'm okay. Whoa, hold your horses though, because we're not done with 1987 yet. As of the 13th of June that year, the Erasmus Project was launched. Named after what, 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 what? a Dutch philosopher and scholar of the Northern Renaissance, the Erasmus scheme provides funds for university students to study in another European country. Over 10 million people have taken advantage of the scheme since it's launched. Where was this when I was in uni? Number 51. And just like that, the 80s were over. The Berlin Wall had come down and more European integration was on the agenda. In fact, Germany was reunited in October 1990, and in doing so, the eastern half of the country also joined the European Union, the first expansion of the decade, even if it wasn't a new member state. Number 52. Speaking of additions, the 90s saw three new countries join the European Union, Austria, Finland and Sweden. The trio all joined on the 1st of January 1995. For anyone not keeping score, that brings the total number of EU countries to 15. Number 53. Let's not get ahead of ourselves because the first half of the 90s was arguably a momentous decade for the European project. Strap in because things are about to start moving fast. On the 1st of January 1993, the single market was launched. This established four key freedoms laid down in 1986, the free movement of people, money, services and goods. Since its inception, a lot of laws have been agreed upon, everything from tax to recognizing professional qualifications, all in the name of boosting economic cooperation. Number 54. In 1992, the Treaty on the European Union was agreed in Maastricht, hence its alternative name, the Maastricht Treaty. This proposed a number of big integrations for the member states and officially created the European Union, which came into existence in 1993. Number 55. This new European Union was made up of three pillars. Pillar 1 is the European communities we're all familiar with, the EEC, the ECSC, and the Eurotom. Pillar 2 is a common foreign and security policy, and Pillar 3 is the cooperation on justice and home affairs, including the creation of the Europol, a European police office to coordinate exchange of information between national law enforcement agencies. Number 56. The treaty also established a European citizenship, with any national of an EU country able to move and travel freely to anywhere else in the EU as well as the right to stand as a candidate in the European and local elections in the country they were living in. Number 57. The last important thing stemming from Maastricht was the creation of the Euro, a common currency for everyone in the EU to use. For this to work, the treaty committed member states to coordinating their national economic policies. The creation of the European Central Bank and the introduction of a single common currency across the bloc by 1999. This happened on the 1st of January with the introduction of the Euro in 11 EU states for commercial and financial transactions. Number 58. <laughs> Remember that rival to the EU founded back in 1960? You know, the EFTA? Well, that was still going in the 1990s. Only the membership had dwindled to just four countries. Iceland, Liechtenstein, Switzerland and Norway. Three of those, everyone barred Sweden, helped create the European Economic Area in 1994, extending the single market to those countries but without fully joining the EU. Number 59. In 1995, the Schengen Agreement was introduced and takes effect in seven countries. Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, Spain and Portugal. This agreement allowed people to travel between those countries without any passport controls. The Schengen area is still in force today, and the only EU countries that are not involved today are Ireland, Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, and Cyprus. Number 60. The 1st of January 2002 saw the proper launch of the Euro, with it becoming the legal tender in 12 EU countries. The big kickoff saw 80 billion coins involved, and just so you know, the coins all have one side that is universal, and which shows the value. Each country has its own design on the other side. Number 61. The new millennium saw the European Union welcome more countries than ever before. In 2004, 10 members joined. Cyprus, Czechia, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Poland, Slovakia and Slovenia. That made 25 members, but the EU still had an appetite for more. In 2007, Bulgaria and Romania jumped aboard, and then in 2013, the 28th member, Croatia, joined the club. The EU was officially massive. Number 62. Bigger than ever and easier to manage do not normally go hand in hand. So in 2009, the Lisbon Treaty was introduced to make the EU more efficient and transparent while also increasing its democratic elements. It made the European Parliament, 
which was elected, remember, and equal to the council, which featured the representatives of the national governments, also removed vetoes in areas like climate change and emergency aid, amongst several other things. Number 63. Believe it or not, but the European Union has its own public holiday, Europe Day. It's celebrated every year on the 9th of May, and this marks the anniversary of the Schuman Declaration of 1950, which set in motion the whole shebang by proposing the European coal and steel community. Nintendo 64? The big question is though, do you get a day off for Europe Day? Well, if you're an employee of the EU, then you are in luck. However, the only EU country to have it as a holiday is Luxembourg, after their parliament introduced it in 2019. Kosovo, which isn't a member, is the other country that lets people take it easy on Europe Day. Number 65. The flag of the European Union is 12 gold stars on a blue background. The number of stars have nothing to do with the number of member states, and they represent unity, harmony, and solidarity. Why 12? Well, according to the EU website, 12 is the figure of perfection and entirety. The circle arrangement is also a sign of union. Number 66. The flag dates back all the way to 1955 when it was adopted by the Council of Europe, which, remember, isn't an EU organization. The EEC, the forerunner of the EU, did not actually propose using it until 1983, and it became an official logo for the community in 1985. The flag was first raised outside an EEC building in 1986. Number 67. The EU's motto is United in Diversity, and it first came into use in the year 2000. It celebrates how Europeans have come together as the EU, as well as the different traditions, languages, and cultures that underpin it. Number 68. The European anthem, which was adopted by the EU in 1985, has no words. It's all about the music, baby. So rather than opt for Bonnie Tyler's 1983 hit, Total Eclipse of the Heart, or Wait for Europe, the band Keep Up, and the 1986 mega hit, The Final Countdown, those EU bigwigs opted for Beethoven's Ode to Joy from his Ninth Symphony in 1823. To be fair, it's a solid choice. Number 69. Politics? Question mark? It is highly unlikely the Vatican City will ever be able to join the EU. New members have to be democratic, and the Vatican is a theocracy. Then there is the fact that it doesn't have a market economy. It just doesn't fit the bill. That said, it does use the euro as its currency, and it does allow free movement, although it's not formally part of the Schengen Agreement. Number 70. In fact, there are several countries that do not have membership of the EU, but still use the euro. We've got the Vatican City, Monaco, San Marino, and Dora. These countries even have the right to strike their own designs for the euro coins, but not notes. Kosovo and Montenegro also use the currency, but don't have a formal agreement with the EU. Number 71. Okay, you all knew this was coming, so let's just calm down and respect everyone's opinions. Cool? Great. So, Brexit. British exit from the European Union. It took place officially on the 31st of January 2020 at 11 p.m. GMT. In doing so, the UK became the first country to leave the EU. Number 72. Turns out though, leaving the EU takes a reasonable amount of time, about three and a half years to be precise. The UK held a referendum on whether to leave or remain in the EU in June 2016. The result was 52% in favor of leaving. Number 73. To leave the EU, a country must trigger Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, which also lays down the rules on the process for leaving. Once it's been invoked, there is a two-year window to sort everything out and come to a new trade or political agreement. Alternatively, a country can just leave without a new deal of any kind. Number 74. Britain did not trigger this article until March 2017. So, bit of quick maths, we should have left on March 2019, about 10 months earlier than its actual exit at the end of January 2020. The reason for the delay was that negotiating the withdrawal agreement took a bit longer than expected and required a couple of extensions to that two-year deadline. Number 75. Even when Britain did officially leave on the 31st of January 2020, it unofficially didn't really leave as it continued to follow EU rules, was still part of the single market, customs union, and all the rest of it. This transition period lasted until 11pm GMT on the 31st of December 2020 and gave the UK and EU time to negotiate an agreement on their future relationship, which they did. Either way, it's safe to say that the UK is now no longer part of the EU. Number 76. 
However, while the UK might be the first member state to withdraw from the European Union, it isn't the first time a territory has left the organization. In 1962, Algeria, which the eagle-eyed among you might have noticed is in Africa, left after gaining its independence from France that year. Number 77 Greenland, which remains Danish territory, governs itself in a lot of areas, and geographically is part of North America, also decided to leave in 1985 after holding a referendum with 52% in favor of leaving. Even as far away as the Caribbean, the island St. Barthélemy, which was part of the EU as a French territory, decided to leave in 2012. Number 78 The European Union, despite what its name might suggest, is not found solely in Europe. There are nine places which sit inside the EU, even if geographically they're not all that close. These places are labeled as the outermost regions of the European Union. They don't always follow all the EU laws and aren't necessarily part of the Schengen area, but things like the euro currency are legal tender. Number 79. In the Indian Ocean, we have Mayotte and La Réunion. In the North Atlantic, there are the Azores, Madeira, and Canary Islands. Over in the Caribbean, we have Guadalupe, Martinique, and St. Martin. And finally, measuring at 83,500 square kilometers, it's French Guiana in South America. All of these wonderful places that I definitely said wrong are part of the EU. Number 80. At the time of writing, no country has ever decided to join the Eurozone, the part of the EU that uses the Euro as currency, and then leave. Although Greece came very close in 2015, leading to the term Grexit. The Greek economy was badly hit by the financial crises that hit the world economy from 2008 onwards, and it ended up racking up a lot of debt. Number 81. In order to get Greece to pay out the money it owed, it needed bailout loans to be approved from institutions like European Central Bank. EU member states and the International Monetary Fund. Those loans came with conditions. Tax rises, budget cuts, you get the drift. And in 2015, the Greek population voted 61% against a key bailout designed to save the Greek economy and keep the Eurozone intact. Number 82. Ultimately, the Greek government did negotiate another bailout later in 2015 that kept them in the Eurozone. Had they left it, it is likely that they would have started using the drachma again, and there were fears that other countries might decide to leave the euro in the future. Number 83. Imagine trying to get into a club for more than 30 years and still being in the queue today. You've just imagined Turkey's application to join the European Union, which officially started all the way back in 1987 and is no way near complete. Turkey has been involved in European integration since 1959 and has an association agreement with the EU, which was agreed in 1963, but it still isn't a full member. Number 84. Discussions on it joining the EU began properly in 2005 but it's fair to say these aren't moving quickly. Before Turkey can join, it needs to sort out 35 so-called negotiation chapters. These cover areas ranging from science and tech to transport and fishing. Of those 35, only 16 chapters have been opened. According to the Organization for World Peace, the application is basically frozen. Number 85. Other prospective EU members include Albania, the Republic of North Macedonia, Montenegro, and Serbia. Bosnia and Herzegovina are also in the process of becoming a candidate for EU expansion. Number 86. Now, I promised we'd run through how the EU actually works, but this isn't 1001 facts. <laughs> am I right? Yes, I am right. So let's kick off with the European Council, as this one is super easy to explain. Basically, every few months, the leaders, the heads of state or government, of each member state meet up and decide the key priorities for the EU. Agreements are generally reached unanimously. Number 87. Moving on to the snappily named Council of the European Union, here ministers from each member state work together to help make laws, adopt EU budget, and decide on the EU's external relations. The ministerial meetings are done by subject, so the finance ministers from each member state work together, energy ministers work with other energy ministers. You get the idea. Most of the decisions are made by majority voting. Number 88. Then we've got the European Parliament. This shares responsibility for drafting and debating laws with the Council of the European Union, and also plays a part in the adoption of long-term EU budgets and approves the EU's annual budget. It also keeps an eye on other EU institutions and ensure EU funds are used correctly. Number 89. Currently, there are 705 MEPs, and these are elected every five years by EU citizens. The Parliament supervises the European Commission, which comes up with proposals for new laws. 
These are then discussed in 20 committees, which are small groups of MEPs working on a specific area, and finally the laws are put to the entire parliament to decide. Number 90. Then there is the European Commission, which holds the so-called right of initiative. This basically means this group gets to propose new EU laws. No other EU institution is allowed to do this. It also proposes what the EU budget should be. Each member state is represented by one commissioner from that country, although the commissioners are there to work for the interests of the EU rather than their country of origin. Number 91. Every political system needs an enforcer, but what happens if one country flouts an EU law or interprets it the wrong way? Well, the EU's equivalent of Judge Trudy is the Court of Justice of the European Union, which sounds like it has significantly less lobsters. Judges from all over member states sit here and interpret the EU's laws and make sure they are following by the countries. States, companies and individuals can also bring cases to the court too, providing they fall under EU law. Number 92. Having one currency running across 19 member states also requires some coordination, and those Eurozone countries look to the European Central Bank for that. Located in Frankfurt, its job is to ensure the stability of prices across all these countries and make sure the currency's value is protected. Number 93. The European Parliament is the biggest but also the only directly elected international body on Earth. However, with a total population of 450 million people, give or take, it isn't the biggest democracy in the world. It's ahead of the USA, but still behind the 1.4 billion living in India. Number 94. The European Union has no army and defense is something which each member state handles itself. However, it does encourage coordination between countries on military matters and has a European Defense Fund to help with this. France is the EU member state with the biggest military, although Germany and Italy are not far behind. Number 95. Even though it's not a state in and of itself, the EU does have a role at the United Nations. It has had a permanent observer status since 1974 at the General Assembly and has observer status in a lot of UN agencies. It even has full voting rights in three UN bodies. It is the only non-state to have signed up to more than 50 UN conventions. Number 96. If you look at a Euro banknote, you'll see images of bridges, gateways, and windows. When the Euro launched in 2002, the European Monetary Institute commissioned those designs, and those lovely images were completely made up. Those bridges didn't even exist. Why? So that no country could be offended at not having their landmarks included on the notes. There would be no national bias. However, in 2011, a Dutch artist went and built the bridges anyway in the Netherlands. All those fake bridges are now real Dutch bridges. Good job, guys. Number 97. The 500 euro note had the nickname the Bin Laden because of its alleged use in financing terrorism. There were also concerns that the massive denomination helped with tax evasion, money laundering, drug smuggling and human trafficking. The solution? Get rid of the 500 euro note. So the European Central Bank stopped printing new ones and in 2019, national banks of member states stopped recirculating them. They're still accepted by banks but will effectively be phased out over time. Number 98. EU rules recommend that member states adopt a burgundy colour for all passports. This is to make them uniform and ensure quicker border checks. And 26 of the 27 EU states use that colour. The exception to the rule is Croatia, which has kept a dark blue shade for its passports as the burgundy was thought to be too like old red coloured ones used before the collapse of Yugoslavia. Number 99. A Euromyth is the name given to news stories about ridiculous and sometimes fake interpretations of EU laws. The classic example is that the EU banned curved bananas, which they didn't. This comes from a misinterpretation of the EU regulations that state bananas must be free from abnormal curvature. Even then, lower grade bananas are allowed to have defects of shape, so your average banana is not under threat from the EU. Ladies and gentlewomen, it's time for number 100. Another classic Euromyth was that EU regulations on cabbages were 26,911 words long. In fact, the rules on cabbages standards are 1,800 words long. Still a lot, but more of a short story than a novel. It's time for 101. In 2012, the EU won the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition for transforming Europe, in the words of the Nobel Committee, from a continent of war to a continent of peace. So that was 101 facts by the European Union. Do you live in an EU classified country? Uh, do you want to?
Are you having like a good day? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, while you're down there, why not give us a like and maybe subscribe and such? That'd be pretty fun. I think you'll enjoy that. I know I'll enjoy you doing that. Also, wow! Check out the two videos on the screen at the moment. One, I think you'll like, and the other, I also think you'll like. Why not watch both at the same time to see what they'll be? I can guarantee you that they probably won't be me talking. They'll be Sam. I haven't got much to add to this, so I'm going to go. Bye, guys.